In democracies across the world, one of the most impactful things that you can do as an individual is to vote. And this year, more than 2 billion people around the world will have that opportunity, including where I live in the UK. On the 4th of July, UK voters will head to their polling stations to cast their ballots for the candidates they want to represent them in the House of Commons, the lower chamber of the UK Parliament. In a general election, parties are standing on broad platforms, covering everything from the economy to immigration, from health and social care to education, from infrastructure to science and climate change. What's most important to you may land in one of these categories, it may be in something else. As a PhD student and a scientist who wants to work in academic scientific research in the future, the areas of science and education are really important to me. They weigh in a lot when I'm deciding who to vote for and I think they should weigh in for you as well. The point of this video is not to tell you who to vote for though. The point is that you should leave this more informed about what the different parties are offering so that you can make an informed decision about who to give your vote to. To try and make this video as short and effective as it can be, I'm only going to talk about the seven major parties standing across Great Britain. That is Scotland, England and Wales. I'm not going to talk about Northern Ireland, partially because as a Scot I don't feel particularly qualified to comment on the political situation in Northern Ireland, and partially because some of those parties just haven't published manifestos at time of recording. I'll put some resources in the description for voters in Northern Ireland, but I can't promise they'll be the most current. I'm also going to focus primarily on higher education and further education. I'll talk about schools if they're going to have an impact on universities and colleges, or if they're really core to the party's overall plans for the education sector, but I don't want to spend too much time on them. With all that out of the way, let's start with the incumbent party, the Conservative and Unionist Party, also known as the Tories. The Tories came to power in 2010 under David Cameron in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Since then they've won elections in 2015, 2017 and 2019. They've had four more Prime Ministers, including the very short-lived term of Liz Truss, and their current Prime Minister and leader Rishi Sunak. The Conservatives are a right-wing party that have presided over a programme of austerity over the past 14 years, leading to cuts to public services, including the NHS and education. Despite this, they put the areas of science and innovation at the very core of their manifesto in this election campaign. Many of their plans, however, have already been announced or even put in motion in the latter months of the last Parliament. Before I talk about the Tories' plans for education, it's worth noting that education is a devolved issue. That means that in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, education is dealt with by the devolved governments in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast respectively. Core to the Conservatives' plans in education is a reform to post-16 education. Under the Conservatives' plans, they would replace A-levels and T-levels with an advanced British standard that would only apply to England by default. The Conservatives say this would get rid of the artificial divide between academic subjects studied as A-levels and technical subjects studied as T-levels. It would expand the number of subjects taken by high school students to five. This would be more similar to the Scottish Hires system or the International baccalaureate. Beyond qualifications, the Conservatives are also focusing their attention on what they perceive as the culture in schools, with policies such as complete bans on mobile phones during the school day and a ban on the teaching of gender ideology in schools. Looking to higher education, that is universities, the Conservatives want to place more government authority on university institutions, with plans to ban courses that they see as poor value due to what they describe as excessive dropout rates or lower salaries for graduates. International students will also be affected by the Conservatives' plans for immigration. They intend to stop international students bringing dependents to the UK and to remove the student discount to the immigration health surcharge. This is a levy that gives international students access to the NHS. Despite this, the Conservatives say they will continue to attract the best and brightest to our universities, though they don't say how they're going to do that. Turning now to science and research, science is intrinsically linked to the high skills, high tech economy that the Conservatives champion and as such there are a number of commitments in this area, including an increase in the public spending on research and development, increasing this to £22 billion a year up from £20 billion. They also say they would invest £1.5 billion in large scale compute clusters, that is supercomputers, with an aim to increase research into artificial intelligence and its responsible 
uses. Their manifesto also makes little mention of further funding of research and development into climate solutions, which sadly aligns with their recent record on the climate, which has included new licenses for coal mines and oil fields. Offering a very different view of science and education are the ideologically centrist Liberal Democrats. The Lib Dems have struggled since leaving their coalition with the Conservatives in 2015 due to a broken promise on tuition fees. Despite this, they put strong proposals into science and education at the core of their manifesto. On scientific research, the Lib Dems support the UK continuing its role in the Horizon Europe programme. This is a Europe-wide funding scheme that has benefited many UK scientists with grant money. They also support the UK joining the European Innovation Council. This is a body that's been set up to help high-risk, high-impact technologies come to market. They also propose increasing UK public spending on research and development to 3% of GDP by 2030 and to 3.5% of GDP by 2034. These ambitions go far beyond what the Conservatives have laid out. On the topic of education, the Liberal Democrats are once again trying to win the support of students and their families with a proposed return to maintenance grant for disadvantaged students. They also propose a mental health charter that would give universities an obligation to ensure that mental health services are available to their students, and they propose that the UK rejoin the Erasmus programme as an associate member. This would give UK students the opportunity to study abroad for a year in another European country. While these are all laudable goals, many universities are feeling the pinch financially at the moment with the rising costs due to inflation and falling student numbers, particularly internationally in the wake of Brexit. The Liberal Democrats do recognise this and they propose a review to higher education funding in the next five year parliamentary term, though little detail is given here. Whether these policies are enough to win back the voters they lost in 2015, only time will tell. Before we cover the rest of the parties standing across the majority of the UK, let's have a look at Scotland and Wales, both of whom have parties that stand only in those countries. We'll start with Scotland. The Scottish National Party, or SNP, currently lead the Scottish Government in Edinburgh. They've been a dominant force in Scottish politics for the past couple of decades. They first came to power in Holyrood in 2007 under Alex Salmond, and since then have performed extremely well in elections to both the Scottish Parliament and Westminster, most notably in 2015 where they took all but three of the parliamentary seats in Scotland. They've been in power in Holyrood longer than the Conservatives have been in power in Westminster, and after more than a decade of very strong performance, the cracks are now starting to show. The SNP's current leader, veteran politician John Swinney, is the party's second leader in only about 18 months. He took the reins of the party a mere two weeks before Rishi Sunak called this general election. The SNP's core policy is its support of Scottish independence, and as such this is a running theme throughout their manifesto. They're also aware that by standing in fewer than 10% of the seats in this election, they will not be forming the government. Rather, they pledge for additional powers to be devolved to Scotland around borrowing, amongst other things. University tuition is already free in Scotland for Scottish domiciled students at Scottish universities. This is something the SNP are very proud of and pledge to protect through the next Parliament. As education is a devolved issue, there isn't really much else on education in their manifesto. On the topics of science and innovation, the SNP support research into artificial intelligence with a view of using it to improve public services, something that's already happening within Citizens Advice Scotland in their call centres. They're also calling on the new UK government to match their £500 million investment into the northeast of Scotland to support the just transition away from oil and gas. There's not much detail given on how that money will be spent, but it will be going into green industries, which will necessitate some additional research and development into those topics. And finally, the SNP supports rejoining the European Union, though they emphasise doing this as an independent country. One of the benefits they cite is being able to rejoin the Erasmus Study Abroad programme as a full member rather than the more limited associate membership proposed by the Liberal Democrats. Looking to Wales, we have Plaid Cymru. This translates as Party of Wales. They are ideologically very similar to the SNP, sitting to the left of centre. Plaid Cymru's long-term goal is Welsh independence, with devolution of more powers to the Welsh Senate in Cardiff Bay being more immediate goals. There's very little in Plaid Cymru's manifesto on science and research beyond a vague commitment to support the UK investing more in these areas. No figure is 
given. They do, however, have a lot on education, particularly as it pertains to Wales. Plaid Cymru wants to get more teachers teaching and so proposes a review of all teacher bursary schemes to ensure they are effective. They support more education being provided through the medium of Welsh and allowing Welsh-speaking academics to do their research in Welsh. Plaid Cymru also supports increasing student numbers at Welsh universities by increasing the number of Welsh domiciled students attending Welsh universities while maintaining the number of students coming from the rest of the UK and internationally. They also propose scrapping tuition fees with a new funding model that will be viable for higher education. It's worth noting that as education is devolved some of these policies may be dealt with by the Welsh government in Cardiff not by the UK government in Westminster. Returning to parties standing in the majority of seats across the UK, let's look at the Green Party. Specifically, I'm talking about the Green Party of England and Wales. The Scottish Greens and the Green Party Northern Ireland are separate political parties that, quite frankly, have no chance in this election under the UK's first-past-the-post electoral system. The Green Party of England and Wales, hereafter referred to as the Greens, is a left-wing party with an unsurprisingly broad portfolio on climate change. They also have a range of other progressive policies in their manifesto. Festo. Like their counterparts in Scotland and Northern Ireland, the Greens struggle under the UK's first-past-the-post electoral system. However, since 2010 they've held the seat of Brighton Pavilion with MP Caroline Lucas, the former leader of the party. She is stepping down at this election. Despite the departure of Caroline Lucas, the Greens are hoping to retain Brighton Pavilion as well as expanding their parliamentary party by taking the seats of Bristol Central, Waveney Valley in East Anglia and Hereford North. Alongside their climate policies and the most revolutionary fiscal plans of this election, the Greens have a wide range of policies in science and education that they say can be funded by their economic measures, though the majority of their manifesto is largely un. Costed. In science and research, the Greens propose an increase in public spending on R&D of £30 billion over the next Parliament. This will work out to an average of around £26 billion per year, which is more ambitious than the Conservatives, and it's a little hard to compare to the Lib Dems because they gave a percentage rather than a raw number. On education, the Greens say they would end the VAT exemption on tuition fees for private schools, reinvesting the money raised by this tax into state school education, with £8 billion for schools through £3 billion pounds for sixth form colleges and £12 billion pounds for further education colleges. This would apply to England only as education is devolved to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Like Plaid Cymru and the SNP, the Greens are opposed to university tuition fees. They would scrap them altogether. They'd also cancel all graduate debt and replace student loans with maintenance grants. Like the Lib Dems, the Greens support rejoining the Erasmus scheme as an associate member, allowing UK students to study abroad in a European country for a year. In addition to this, the Greens are very pro-European. They support the return to free movement, the customs union and the EU itself, policies that have played well with younger generations and particularly students. Our penultimate party is perhaps one of the more unusual parties in this election, Reform UK. This is the latest party headed up by Brexiteer Nigel Farage. Founded as the Brexit Party, Reform UK is a right-wing populist party pushing a very right-wing economic and socially conservative policy agenda. Almost every page of their manifesto explains how they would cut public spending, so it's not surprising there's no mention of science or research and development spending in their manifesto. Reform UK does have plans in education though, and here they diverge dramatically from most of the other parties. Standing in stark contrast to the Greens and the Labour Party, Reform UK would not levy VAT on private school tuition fees, meaning parents wouldn't be paying a 20% value-added tax on those fees. They also say they would ban what they term as trans ideology from schools, putting a complete ban on gender questioning, social transitioning and changing preferred pronouns. Their plans for the higher education sector are also drastic. Like the Conservatives, Reform UK say they would ban international students from bringing dependents to the UK. They also say that they would cut funding to universities they describe as having undermined free speech. No clarity is given on what that would entail. Reform UK also supports cuts to undergraduate student numbers well below current 
levels. There's limited detail in the manifesto on how they would do this or what this level would be. However, in a recent interview with ITV, Nigel Farage did say he would remove tuition fees for people studying STEM subjects, but that for everyone else there were too many people going to university. This would likely have knock-on effects with fewer people going into art subjects for teaching, which may impact core subjects like English. Reform also say they would cancel all student loan interest, but that they would increase the repayment timescale for the capital value to 45 years, as well as forcing UK universities to offer two-year undergraduate courses rather than the existing three-year courses common across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. These would be some of the shortest undergraduate degrees across Europe. It's unclear if they would be accepted by employers and postgraduate study providers across Europe and the rest of the world. And that leaves us with our final party, the Labour Party, led by Sir Keir Starmer. If I had to describe the Labour Manifesto in a single phrase, it would be careful but hopeful. The Labour Party hasn't been in power in Westminster since 2010. They've suffered a series of electoral defeats in recent years, most recently the 2019 majority for the Conservatives. Since then, Jeremy Corbyn has been replaced as leader by Sir Keir Starmer and the party has adopted a position more similar to that of Tony Blair's New Labour from the 1990s, a more centre-left party than it was under Corbyn when it was more left-wing. Most of the Labour manifesto focuses on delivering for working families in areas such as housing and healthcare and on economic growth. There's not really much emphasis on science or research and development in the manifesto. Labour's science and innovation pledges appear more structural than specific in financial commitment. Like the Conservatives and the SNP, Labour pledged support for the AI sector. This is a sector that is very under-regulated at the moment. They also pledged to create a national data library. This is something that the UK is very sorely missing. Currently the onus is on universities and researchers to preserve and maintain the data created and collected for research. This is something that is entirely unsustainable in the era of big data. Labour also pledges to scrap short-term funding cycles for key research institutions in favour of 10-year budgets. The aim here is to enable better collaboration between academia and industry. This has been welcomed by both industry and by academic societies such as the Royal Society of Chemistry. In education, Labour have policies covering the entire sector, including the recruitment of 6,500 additional teachers, particularly in areas such as maths. They'd also levy VAT on private school tuition fees, reinvesting that money into state school education with new mental health professionals in every single school. They also want to reform post-16 education to be broader, though limited detail is given. Labour also proposes guaranteed training, an apprenticeship or help to find work for all 18 to 21 year olds leaving school and they want to improve the integration between higher education and further education to improve social mobility between colleges and universities. While they don't currently support free tuition for universities or the abolition of student loans in favour of maintenance grants, Labour do recognise that universities are struggling financially at the moment as is shown by the large number of universities instituting hiring freezes and volunteers voluntary severance packages, and they pledge to reform the financing for the sector going forwards. So those are the seven major parties standing for election in Great Britain on the 4th of July, and that's what they're standing for in science and education. If you found this useful, please do like the video and subscribe for future ones, and pass it on to somebody else. This is the most important thing. Send it to someone who might not have decided what they're going to vote for yet. Elections are huge, the parties stand on a very wide ranging platform. I couldn't cover everything in this video, I couldn't even cover the related area on climate change. Fortunately the wonderful Dr Simon Clark has made a video on this very topic so I'd recommend you go and watch that next, see what they're pledging on the climate. Thank you all very much for watching, get out and vote, and I'll see you in the next one.